Okay. Um, Assalamualaikum and very good afternoon to all of you. Welcome to Invisys webinar lecture series 3 uh, for the year 2022. I'm Dr. Nor Azlan Nor Muhammad, your moderator for today's webinar. I hope the video that we played just now had provided you with some background of Invisys. So for those who are interested to collaborate with us, you are most welcome to do so. Feel free to browse Inbiosis website and social media for the latest updates and info. I feel so grateful today that all of us are granted good health and time to attend our webinar series. This is our third webinar for this year. There will be many more webinars to come and I hope all of you will join again in the future. Inbiosis webinar series is established to provide a knowledge and research experience sharing platform to ensure we are still connected with each other and stay motivated in our research despite this sudden pan pandemic. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our honorable speaker for today, Prof. T.S. Dr. Tengku Haziyamin Tengku Abdul Hamid from Kulia of Science International Islamic University Malaysia. Allow me to share with you Prof. Dr. Tengku Haziyamin CV. Prof. Tengku Haziyamin received his Bachelor of Science in Biochemistry from UCC Ireland in 1995 and his Master's of Science in Food and Agricultural Biotechnology from University of Reading, United Kingdom in 1996. He began his academic career as a tutor at University Technology Malaysia, UTM, Skudai, and later joined Kulia of Science, International Islamic University in Malaysia in 2003. In 2009, he received his PhD in Enzyme Technology at University Putra Malaysia, UPM. Since then, he has been involved in the teaching and developing curriculum in the Department of Biotechnology. He was appointed the head of department 2009 to 2010, then deputy dean academic 2010 to 2014. Also, he was appointed as head at uh, Research Management Center, RMC, IIM, IIUM Kuantan Campus for the year 2017. Currently, he was reappointed as head of department, uh, Department of Biotechnology. He has published his works in scientific journals, magazines, newspapers, and also has been appointed as reviewers for numerous manuscripts, including those from Scopus and WOS. He has been invited as external examiners from master's and PhD thesis in biotechnology field throughout Malaysia. He is also a lifetime member of the Asian Federation of Biotechnology, AFOB, Malaysia Society for Microbiology, MSM, and Malaysia Society for Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, MSBMB, and a professional technologist under the MBOT. His expertise is in microbial enzymes, gene cloning, protein expression, and purification, a part of his interest in protein structure and functional studies. Experimental mutagenesis work on enzymes has expanded his work in bioinformatics areas, since 2019, he was appointed as Vice President 1 for Malaysian Society for Bioinformatics and Computational Biology, MASBIC. His interest in microbial proteins and enzymes has resulted in a lot of microbial screening work being done from diverse ecosystems. His passion in antimicrobial proteins has also inspired his work in microbial screenings for probiotic organisms and antimicrobial protein they produce. Let us welcome uh, Prof. T.S. Dr. Tengku Hazi Amin to share his research findings. Uh, the floor is yours, Prof. I think you are muted.
You're still muted, Prof. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. No, thank okay. you. Okay, again, eh? uh, thank you, Dr. No Azlan, for the kind introduction and uh, in Biosis webinar committees, okay, Prof. Dr. Azura and others uh, in, bio in Biosis uh, members who kindly uh, slot me for this session. And I feel great honor to be invited to share my previous experience on my research in this uh, uh, occasion. So we have a very, very, I know there is a, a very, in social media, there is a earthquake going around, you know, felt in Klang Valley. And here in Kuantan, we have a very heavy rain. So I feel a little bit sorry if you hear some kind of background sounds from uh, behind. Okay. So the title of my uh, webinar today is Understanding the Structure Function Relation to Enhance Industrial Enzyme. So I pick up two examples that. Prof, you cannot see your slides. Oh. You share your slides. Okay. Can you see now? Yes, all right. Okay. Okay, good. All good. Okay. Uh, for the first example that I'm going to highlight is uh, that I'm going to share that uh, based on my previous work before. Okay, as has been mentioned in my uh, background description by Dr. Azlan is that Actually, my uh, a big chunk of my previous experience is spent on administrative work. So many part of my uh, research work pertaining to bioinformatics actually is based on collaborative work. Okay, so the first example that I want to highlight is dehalogenase. So dehalogenase is a very very uh, common enzyme that uh, been used uh, by microbe to detoxify. Uh, organic uh, compound. Uh, some organic compound, especially those halogenated. Halogenated mean compound that have a uh, chlorine, especially and bromide. Okay, bromine inside uh, one of the atom there. So it need to be detoxified by removal of this uh, halogen. So there, uh, in order to detoxify this compound, this uh, this halogen must be removed okay first so there are many many types of uh the uh, halogenase enzyme that we use to remove this okay so uh, industrial uh, uh pesticide or many type of industrial chemical use actually they are also is a derivative of this halogen uh, compounds so so these are very common contaminants that harmful in the uh, that present in our environment so the in the main one of the concern in understanding this uh, uh the halogenase is that, that the nature of the substrate that act by the halogenase they are consist of stereoisomers so we have d and we have that l okay for example so ability of the microbial enzyme for instance to break or to remove this halogen from this uh, compounds result in the uh, varieties of the halogenase that classified because of these stereoisomers. Thereby, we have a D specific, we have L specific, and we have D and L specific. Whereby the, the halogenase is doesn't selective; okay? it can degrade both D and L. Okay. So, uh, due to this. Uh, uh, stereo selective of the substrate also we have diverse uh, group of the halogenase that can be isolated from several type of microorganism okay very very common previously very established that this uh, rhizobium is a soil microbe that's uh, producing the halogenase d e and l okay d e and d and e are grouped in group one because of their non-stereo character. Okay, group one can be either D and L non-stereo or can be D. So group two 
okay specific for l okay so so the question come is that different type of uh is uh, uh halogenase may use different type of mechanism okay so d l or non-stereo can have different mechanism from l or d itself that the, one of the question we going to ask okay we, we're going to answer in this work okay def one and dl deck structures have been well studied so this is the only crystal structure that available in uh, when you want to study an enzyme you have to compare with the existing crystal structure so unfortunately the the crystal structure that available is not belonging to uh, rhizobia it's belong to pseudomonas okay but luckily the the similarity maybe more than 70 percent so it's a good opportunity for us to explore okay because of the the crystal structure is not much difference so what more we need to know about non-stereo specific dehalogenase okay so structure functional studies of non-stereo specific poorly understood compared to stereo compared to d specific or l specific okay that the, 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 the thing that uh, why we explore in this non-stereo mechanism of dehalogenation are they are the non-stereo and stereo are that similar so this is uh, something that we want to explore okay in terms of catalytic residues okay the uh, residue aspartate 189 okay uh, that is one of the proposed to be crystal structure def one okay based on smith Berger work in 2008 and also aspartate 184 is proposed in DLDEX okay so DLDEX also quite not that similar it's a little bit different compared to that one the pseudomonas okay binding residues okay F37 okay and then uh, S188 okay uh, serine Okay, as in that one, okay, uh, the binding residue we compare with the serine because they are close. Okay, so a question that remained uh, quite uh, uh, important when talking about enzyme, rational design, and things like that is whether to understand whether what type of mechanism. So, so just like many many enzymes, if you look at, uh, uh, we will see that the 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 hydrolysis. We start with a nucleophilic attack. Okay, so so in case of uh, death E, so if we follow the similarity, uh, the similar enzyme like death one, so it follow direct attack instead of uh, commonly found tetrahedral intermediate. Okay, the one that you show and the B is a uh, the one that you commonly see in many hydrolytic enzymes that involving tetrahedral intermediate. Okay, but indirect attack means the water molecule just attacking the acidic residue to release the, the halide okay, without the formation of tetrahedral intermediate. So which one? Whether A and B, that's the one that we want to uh, look to answer this question. So our comp computational work involving, okay, we have the sequence analysis, we have the 3D modeling, okay, and then we uh, look at the uh, docking, okay, enzyme substrate binding studies. We carry out MD simulation also, dash E with E2CP and dash E with both uh, substrate D and L. And we look at hydrogen bond, activation distance, angle of approach of the atom, and so on. So, all these are very, very common work when you talk about MD simulation. Lah. So, I don't have to highlight very detail. Okay. And the, the the one thing that we carried out after we did computational work also we did a uh, mutation studies okay we we create four mutant design uh, actually we have many mutants about 12 mutants. The, the one that we based on uh in siligo information that we get actually the four okay the three binding sites that been uh, described based on dash e crystal structure and also uh, active site residue that uh, aspartate 189 okay this is our mutations so 
we built the structure okay it's a 296 amino acid base they one based on that one template okay it is 72 percent similarity and 12 important residues that uh, we found based on in situ analysis okay annotation okay we have 12 important residues including those those three that uh, we highlighted when we compare with crystal structure okay so the role of aspartate 1 and is very important in catalysis okay rather than binding residues so based on docking work we found that for both uh, 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 substrate dnl okay show hydrogen bond with uh, all three uh, binding sites okay and also uh, asparagine 114 which is quite close to active site uh, aspartate 189 actually is found to hold uh, one uh, hydrogen one water molecule which oriented toward the alpha carbon of both substrate so we found this uh, quite uh, obvious for both substrate which we start uh, explore later on so based on our metagenesis study what we found is that okay uh, the uh, for all the 12 mutants but the four or five uh, there are four mutants that very very uh, strikingly affected by this uh, amino acid change okay so w34a okay and then uh, f37a and also n114d okay we can see including the s118 they lost in 80 percent almost of the activity for both L and D. Okay, so we see, we also see that uh, aspartate 189 result in total loss of the activity that is uh, consistent with this uh, amino acid that involved in catalysis. Okay, because they are lost in 80 percent, almost 100 percent. Okay, so this is the one that the one where also. We observe so it's consistent with uh, what we reported for the death one okay except we have extra uh n114 and also uh w37a if i'm not, if I'm not mistaken also play roles in in binding site okay so md simulation result shown very interesting observation that uh, the water uh, the water molecule that presents uh, close to the uh, asparagine 114 are slowly re being replaced with another water molecule uh, you can see after 22 nanoseconds you can see that the water to start to replace and start to uh, become closer to the aspartate 189 Okay. so this is uh, when we compare with that one the crystal structure okay with d okay also but uh, they 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 uh, they having a replacement in the very beginning about maybe about four nanoseconds but but this uh, second water molecule just just sit there for a long period of time until 50 nanoseconds so uh, anyway our our Simulation for death E to CP is a little bit irregular in that sense that because we didn't use a crystal structure, we use a very just a refined structure that from homology modeling. So that's another reason that that why we have this. But the the interesting is the replacement of water molecule that we observe is that the first water molecule just came in. Uh, I mean the, the the second water molecule came in, replacing the first water molecule that actually interacting with our ASN, asparagine 114 okay you can see uh, from the first panel and then the second panel and then and then followed by uh, water molecule number two just replace and remain there to 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 become close to the substrate the blue color substrate in the middle okay so so reposition, repositioning of the water number two uh, consistent with the direct attack mechanism okay because uh, this is in order for the water molecule to to be activated okay it have to be positioned itself near the aspartic 189 and thereby the hydroxide ion 
being uh, produced uh, that direct to the alpha carbon of the DC2, the DCT substrates. So it's consistent with direct attack mechanism. So this is what we observe in, in our uh, simulation. Okay. And, and, it, and it shows that it play, play roles in this uh, uh, dehalogenation. Okay. So in conclusion, what we can say is that non stereohaloacid halogenase from rhizobia share similar structure and identical to, uh, identity with uh, active site with group one, which is uh, from from Pseudomonas. Okay. So three binding residues in that E hold the substrate instead of only two proposed being reported for crystal DH1. Okay. And uh, that E uses a direct attack. It's confirmed that that E just like any other non-stereo uh, rhizobium, also are, are using direct mechanism, similar like pseudomonas or any other non-stereo uh, dehalogenase. Okay, so so this is what we did a small work that we did uh, with a dehalogenase. But uh, I would like to to educate uh, my thanks to many collaborators that involved in this project, especially. The, uh, Prof. Prof. Faro Zaman Huyu, and also my previous PhD student, okay, Associate Prof. Dr. Azme. So currently he's my colleagues, okay, also a member of MASBI, okay. He's the one who, the other one who pioneered in this work as well, including Hassanuddin, also one of the students who worked in the MD simulation, okay, he's graduated, okay. So they, 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 this is uh, my main collaborator in this work. So, can I proceed to my second example, okay, microbial lipase. So, work, my work on lipase actually is a rational design uh, strategy in the improvement of solvent stability of lipase. Okay. So, lipase are industrial versatile enzymes. So, it is, a, it is recognized as triacylglycerol as a hydrolase or EC3113. It, it hydrolyzed long chain triglyceride. So triglyceride, we know an ester, okay, is a, is a molecule that ma made up of fatty acid and glycerol. Okay. So it's an ester. Okay. Widespread use in food, paper, detergent, and many, many industries that we can mention. Okay. They are very, very versatile. Okay. They important. Hydrolysis, ester synthesis, acidolysis, interesterification, alkalysis, and minolysis. All these are involved in many, many use and many, many chemical, synthetic chemistry preparations. Okay. So, the, what so important about solvent stable lipase? Okay. We know that uh, when we able to carry out uh, enzymatic reaction in high solvent environment, the reaction favors synthetic direction. So, so carbon in in uh, so we know that lipase are producing esters from carboxylation and alcohol. So we want certain type of esters product. Okay, sometimes uh, uh, high solvent environment encourage okay, the production of these specialty chemicals. Okay? We need more in the right direction of the equations. Enhance transesterification, interesterification under this condition, it improves selectivity towards higher substrate. So many, many substrates or product of uh, lipase reaction actually uh, producing a, a chiral substrate. Okay. So bioactive compound normally have chiral, a chiral. Okay. Also radio selectivity, when you talk about lipase, radio, selectiv radio selectivity is one of the important uh, criteria or features. So a lot of advantage. Okay, the problem is that okay, we know that solvent stability are advantageous. However, okay, solvent usually result in reduction of enzymatic activity. That's the drawback. Okay, if we carry out uh, the enzyme reaction in high solvent environment, usually, usually we have a very, very low uh, uh, recovery and low productivity. That's the main drawback. So, so uh, people have been working very, very hard years 
to, to find how to make the enzyme solvent, solvent stable. Okay, so post, post protein solvent interaction are poorly understood, not, not, not completely understood. It depends on enzyme as well. We can develop strategy to improve the enzyme stability in organic solvent. That's the one of the questions that we worked before. Okay, so the methodology involved in is that we still the same way that we work like the halogenase, we work like expression cloning. Okay, we look at uh, solvent stability study, we create the mutant based on computational work that we carried out. Okay, the computational really we, we did is uh, uh, generate a model and we conduct MD simulation in solvent. So we look at how the enzyme perform in the solvent both in the silico and also in experimental. So this is our experimental result. So so uh, we want to focus on DMS4, octanol and acetone uh, because these are hydrophilic solvent. Okay. So in hydrophilic solvent, okay, because it's very common in industry also, so it's usually result in enzymatic uh, depletion. Okay. If you see the blue color DMSO, you can see that when it reaches 60 percent, okay, the enzyme just lost the activity. So how can we we benefit the enzyme uh, at this region or more than 45 percent if they lost the activity? Okay. So this is our our focus. Okay. So we generate the structure of beta hydroxylase lipase. So luckily we have a very close uh, homolog. Okay. So in, in, in structure biology, you just close, close homolog, then you, you, you feel very, very safe to work with the structure. It's a very common uh, uh, rule of thumb. Okay? So, so what we did in simulation is that, for MD simulation is that uh, we, we found that uh, at the, there is a presence of hydrophobic cluster. Okay? Hydro cluster means a series of hydrophobic amino acid that lined okay, the certain region, especially near the entrance of the enzyme. Okay, we have this. If you see the picture, is the the hydrophobic residues. Okay, this this region is associated also with lead. So when you talk about lipase, actually when the enzyme is a lipid, lipid is a very very sticky molecule. So to enter the enzyme surface, it needs some some opening at the at the enzyme, you know, simply like just small molecule, you know. So a process where they, they call it interfacial activation. Okay. So the lipase need to activate the door so that the door will open and the lipase will come in to the active site. So that the, 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 the idea. So so the presence of this cluster could be very crucial in this type of uh, interfacial. Okay. So what we found is that at six, in 60% DMSO, where the, the activity of life is totally diminished, almost diminished, that, okay, the cluster just totally disorganized and, and lost, collapsed, compared to the one that we see in water. Okay. Interestingly, interestingly okay, uh, the, 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 when we carried out simulation in 100% solvent, but uh, the, 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 the cluster is still uh, there. Okay? But of course, the enzyme is not working uh, like in, in water okay? because of the rigidity of the structure of the molecule, one of the reasons. So it needs water a little bit, just like a uh, lubricant for the enzyme to, to move micro motion in enzyme that required for enzyme catalysis. Okay? So the change in in this uh, uh, mouse, so called the entrance, also, when we compare the 60% DMSO, it's just like the, the closing of the mouse or the, the that, that, in a way, prevent the substrate, just like your lips. Okay? So, in order for lipid to enter, it needs a little bit of uh, some kind of opening. Okay? That, that was the result of simulation, but we, we did it. We, we still cannot uh, do experimental for that, except that we carry out a mutation randomly around not 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 many uh, substrate. Maybe we select some substrate at that time. Okay, 
So value 171, glutamate 141. Okay. So we can it out again. We try to compare, but because of maybe uh, we see a, some kind of very, very small changes, especially enhancement. So we see that compared to the native and the mutant, for valine 171 serine, we see a depletion at 30% in a very small. We think that we, we should go with more mutation at the mouth rather than just side mutation. So this the MSO and methanol, also not much change, but still uh, uh, there's some profile. Of course, this has been verified statistically. Okay. So this is more or less what we see. Okay. We, so in conclusion, the simulation study revealed a presence of hydrophobic cluster region near the mouth and the lip enzyme that associate with interfacial activation pertaining to the lipase. Drop in enzyme activity in sub-solvent level, for example, in sense uh, solvent was due to the collapse of the this hydrophobic cluster that we that I showed you okay so mutation in the cluster region can be used in future rational strategy design okay so we can look at this in order to improve the enzymes activity in organic solvent okay by using this uh, mutation at this uh, uh, mouth Okay, or hydrophobic uh, regions. Okay. So this uh, the information can be get by several publications related to this work. And related to this work as well, I would like to thank my previous uh, supervisors and Prof Raja, Prof Dato Abu Bakar also, and also Allah Allah Yahama Jabu Bahagia, Prof Dr Muhammad Basri, okay, for their work. Okay, involvement of the yeah, actually is part of my my PhD work. Okay, so with that, uh, I end the session and I open the session for question. Okay, Dr. Azlan. Okay, thank you, Prof. Uh, thank you. Um, so interesting work on how uh, you basically both uh, use uh, both uh, wet lab methods and also in silico methods. In trying to figure out uh, how this enzyme works and how um, where, what are the areas of, of improvements that can can be done. Um, so participants who have any questions uh, can uh, place them in the chat. Um, I'll start with one question. Um, so is there a specific strategy on how you select uh, the mutation sites. Uh, is it uh, totally randomly or is there an algorithm or is there um, other factors that you need to um, consider uh, before doing this kind of muta mutation analysis and either both in silico and also in the SA? Okay. Okay. Okay, a very interesting question when working with mutagenesis. This is the this is the common question that being asked by the student. So first, we have to understand that we have to understand the environment surrounding the mutation sites. Okay. okay. What I mean by environment is that you have to understand the interaction. What the what the active site, the binding sites. Okay. Then you have to understand the uh, physical chemical characteristic of the mutation site or, or the target mutation. So hydrophobic, hydrophilic, polar, all that of chemistry features of the mutation site. Sometimes we want to mutate because of the charge. We want to remove the charge. Sometimes we want to mutate because we want to change from hydrophobicity to hydrophilic residue. Sometimes we want to mutate just because we want to remove certain function of the amino acid if we know the function. So, so there is no a clear cut guideline, but we have to understand the function and the uh, we cannot ran randomly unless you are doing uh, what we call a random mutation, and then you have to to fish out experimentally which mutation that turn up in your screening. That's different. Okay, but if you want to do rational, we're talking about rational design. Then you have to know the environment surrounding it and. Quite often, the mutation also have to look into the size 
of that if, if mutation happen in active site, we have to know the size of that uh, 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 side chain. If too much, too bulky, that it will interfere with the whole packing of the proteins uh, side chain, then it may not you may not get the effect that you may want, or the enzyme may can just be not full, not expressed properly also. So a lot of consideration have to be put there. It's not just a pure random when you're talking about rational design. I hope it's clear. Okay. All right. Um, there's one question from No Atira Yusuf. Uh, hi, Prof. Can you explain how substitution to alanine in terms of the intra or interprotein interaction in the dehalogenase cause loss of 80% or more in the activity? Uh, which, uh, which, which, which mutation? Explain how the substitution to alanine. Alanine. So I have to find which one eh, you're talking about. I think it's the... Alanine. There are three mutations for alanine binding sites. Okay. So, so I believe you're talking about W or F or... So alanine is a very uh, uh, neutral amino acid. Okay. Sometimes we, we replace a uh, hydrophobic W. Okay. W is tryptophan. Tryptophan replace to alanine. So we just want to reduce the bulkiness, uh, to reduce the binding site. So, so uh, depend on which one you're talking about, okay? And in serine to alanine also, uh, quite similar in size. So in, in serine to alanine, just we, we reduce the binding site for the serine. So serine also is a polar. So if, when you go to alanine, alanine is a little bit uh, small hydrophobic. So depend on the, the original uh, residue that you're talking about. And alanine is a very small side chain okay so it's, it's it's quite quite easy to to uh, i mean quite safe to replace alanine with anything else okay except that it's a new is it, it's uh considered as a uh what we call hydrophobic amino acids okay is that is that i hope that answer your question all right thank you um, so there's one more from uh, Dr. Nisha. So apart from the mutation, what other feasible strategies can be employed to induce target specific modification of the protein? Okay. Uh, okay. Can you read the question again? So apart from mutation, okay. so other than mutation, other than doing mutation, what other feasible strategies can be employed to induce target specific modification of the protein? The, 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 uh, the work that I've been working is actually is experimental mutagenesis. We, we, are, we are doing rational, rational design strategy. But of course, you can do other than randomly. You can target randomly, like uh, we call it a random mutation. But that one, you need to do some screening experimental, then you go back to uh, computational okay other than that you can also do a random uh, what we call modification enzyme modification you just introduce certain uh, if you know the active site you can target the what we call the certain uh, chemical that react specifically with with that particular target but in in our case we didn't use that strategy so there's various other chemical that you can use to randomly modify, but you must understand that modification can be random. It may not be targeting certain residue that of your concern, especially those at active site, depending on the, the type of enzyme. Of course, uh, active site serine, there are certain uh, regions that can uh, react uh, on serine that present in the active site. Okay? I hope that answered the question. Right. There's another one from Dr. Bazi. Um, so thank you, Prof, for informative talk. Um, with regards to the enzyme technology, could you share the current industrial applications of both enzymes, particularly by Malaysian industries? Oh, okay. 
uh, actually uh, that's a very general question lah. Actually, uh, because I'm 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 working in live base and I need the hello. The areas there's a lot of uh, enzyme, especially in Malaysian landscape. Okay, there are various enzyme, but you you have to understand that uh, uh, industrial uh, enzyme production under local landscape is not as uh it's quite uh, because our economy or our structure market we import a lot of enzyme industrial enzymes so that's a, quite a challenge to 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 locally source our uh locally produce or enzyme from our own r d it's quite a challenge as well so there are various i don't uh, you have to understand that a lot of enzyme used nowadays okay but a lot of these enzymes actually are important. Okay, so we have to work in a way that to convince the industry, so that more more industry will be looking uh, lock as a local source. Okay, so to the source is from a local. Okay, that that's something that we need to look through. Okay, I hope I I hope I answer the question in the perspective of life pace and the hello the means. Okay. Uh, I have one more question, Prof. Um, so, how do you see the correlation between the in silico um, mutagenesis and the assay? What's the correlation like? Like, do you see, let's say, you test something in using molecular dynamics in silico first, then you do the assay, right? So, what's the yeah. correlation rate? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, actually, uh, uh we can't generalize okay because it's this is depending on the uh how many info if you're talking about silico it depends on how much information do you have and secondly uh good silico work actually reflected by availability of the crystal data so if your enzyme or protein have low similarity or low homology with the existing crystal then you may not get a good silico uh, work. It, it doesn't mean that, doesn't mean, uh, because I, I understand that nowadays we have uh, artificial AI using to generate protein structure and those, I think it will be a little bit better. But, but uh, uh, previously, you know, people resort too much on uh, crystal structure a lot. Okay, and perhaps more days we can see more uh, Protein structure being deposited based on prediction using AI technologies. Okay, so so and also we have a new method of uh, crystallize uh, looking at the protein structure other than classical crystallography. We could we can also use a uh, different type of uh, structure determination. They are also coming up. So 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 we hope with that you know it it empower more. Uh, silico works okay but still depend on how much information do you have okay support yours because have the more uh silico work that the more you can do with your silico work but still depending on which enzyme you're talking about okay which protein you're talking about okay all right um there's another question from dr leong um, thank you, Prof, for the interesting talk. Regarding the lipase study, so regarding the lipase study, it was shown that the activity of the enzyme remained active in the solvent hexane. I wonder what is the explanation behind. Okay. Okay, I, I, I show you the slide again. Okay, actually, uh, I, I, we, are not, we are not really uh understand but but the problem with hexane and many hydrophobic solvent okay okay we used to see a very fluctuate okay we, we just put it here for representative of the hydrophobic solvent this fluctuation or this we, we don't say we don't say that this enzyme actually stable i don't i don't see that way lah okay because uh, more more because it's very difficult to conduct assay in hydrophobic solvent because of the nature of the solvent and the nature of the assay, the mixing up and things like that. We have challenge. That's why a lot we have a better data when working with uh, hydrophilic solvent. Okay, 
So I can't say it's stable, okay? But we have this kind of data, okay, in comparison for this our DMSO study. But other data when we talk about hexane and many others uh, hydrophobic solvent, we see all sort of fluctuation. So that because of the mixing and the uh, mixing properties during the assay, that's the challenge that we face when we look at the uh, hydro hydrophobic solvents. Okay. Um. So regarding the molecular dynamics work. Um, do you face a problem of um, having too many hypotheses that you don't have the the compute or the the resources to do the molecular dynamics? Uh, uh, can you repeat the question again? Uh, is there a problem where you have uh, too many uh, hypotheses to try to test um, that you cannot solve with uh, molecular dynamics? And it's easier to do the essay compared to doing molecular yeah, dynamics. Yeah, actually, actually, in my case, in my case, sometimes it work both ways. Sometimes it it it, it good if you work both ways. Uh, but I, I'm doing this work like uh, uh, more than ten years ago. Okay, I mean, I mean, for organic solvent, it's more than ten years ago. So at that time, there's not we only have crystal structure information. Okay, but today you can have a lot of information uh, in your in your database. There are so many many structures, many many things coming up. So I'm sure that doing work now today is a little bit better than 20 years ago or 15 years ago. Okay, so 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 the hypothesis, of course, you better hypothesis can be built if you have a, a wet data. Okay, uh, I'm I'm talking about if I'm looking at in, in our our because I know the solvent stability in in this type of uh, composition because I work on it, but I, I can put the hypothesis on that. But if I didn't have that, well, we have so many solvent. Maybe one solvent hypothesis can be different for other solvent. I don't have the data, so it's very crucial to work both way. It's been must it's good to have data. Uh, partly supported by experimental to work with your hypothesis rather than you rely purely 100% on silico. Okay? I hope, I hope that's helped you. Thank you, Prof. Any other questions on the floor? There's a lot of questions. Eh? So at the moment, we have 45 participants here and uh, over 20 participants on the Facebook Live. So that's almost 70 participants. So in the current landscape of um, this molecular dynamics and uh, structural bioinformatics, um, do you see this kind of work being uh, uh, made high throughput? Because you're doing one enzyme and one enzyme, right? So is there, yeah. uh, are there, are there um, groups or, or, or initiatives uh, to do this kind of work, but in a larger scale, maybe 1,000 enzymes at one go or something like that? Okay. Uh, actually, actually, uh, when we work with the halogenase and we work with uh, lipase, you know, a very small group of people who are working uh, both in experimental and, and computational. But uh, we, we, because we focus on one single enzyme, we, we can have, uh, we didn't, so far we didn't face a problem with too many data. So far we, I, I didn't have that experience. So, but, it, but it's good if we have that. Okay. I, I know that nowadays we have a uh, next generation sequencing data and things like that. Okay, we can do it more better because I have mentioned to you that with all the NGS, with all the uh, AI, you know, sometimes we have a better prediction to build our hypothesis. Okay, 
So surely we can better position because because uh, I I myself in my department, you know, uh, I'm very I'm quite senior to my juniors who are very trained on uh, NGS thing like that. So I have to collaborate with these people when it comes to high throughput. Okay, so so uh, so so collaboration work is very important. If you know the technique of high throughput, but you have to work with people who have been working existing working with certain areas, then you can uh, expand your horizon of your research. That's, that's another way of, of making meaningful of a uh, technique that we have. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you, Prof. Okay, that did I? I see. I see there's no more questions. Um, so, uh, and it's almost 4, 4 p.m. So we have come to the end of the webinar. Uh, we'd like to thank uh, Prof. Uh, Dr. Tengku Hazi Amin uh, for the very interesting research topic and I'm sure has opened up our view and give you an idea on how you want to bring up your research output to the next level. Um, so today's webinar has recorded um, uh, almost 70 participants uh, on both Cisco and uh, FB Live um, web page uh, in BICS UKM. So I would like to thank uh, all the participants spending your time with us uh, today. Uh, so before we say goodbye, let us immortalize this session by switching on your video and have our faces captured. Um, all right. So I pass to the technical team.